honey coming down the tube, beautiful. So today we're going to harvest some honey in the flow hive way and also in the conventional honeycomb collection way. Well, it'll be a little bit unconventional when we get to harvesting the comb actually, but it's a wonderful thing to harvest honeycomb from hives as well. And it's a question we often get is, can you harvest honeycomb? And the answer is yes, you can harvest honeycomb from any type of beehive unless you've used plastic foundation, then that's hard to harvest honeycomb from. But in the brood box, we like to keep it perfectly natural and that's a good spot to collect some honeycomb from. Or you could put a whole nother box right on top of this one and collect honeycomb that way. So we're going to, while this honey's harvesting, go over to a hive over here, smoker, get the smoker out, take the lid off and harvest some comb. But look at that beautiful honey coming into the jar. Don't forget to put your questions in the comments below. We love all your questions. Make sure you put them in. Also let us know whereabouts in the world you are tuning in from. We have flow hive beekeepers all over the world and it's really interesting to us to hear where you are. It's a beautiful light honey today. I'm going to have to have a little taste just because Oh yum, it's that, often the lighter colours have this floral burst to them and that's exactly what this has. It's got this beautiful floral bright note to it of the uh, Goya, which is a, a, a native here, which has a beautiful um, bright flavour to it. You can see we've been harvesting a few different colours of honeys as well with, with um, the light ones and even the black. These are all honeys that came out last week and it's really interesting to have so many different flavors to share and it brings such a story to the table when you're sharing those flavors with your family and friends. Look at that honey going in. While that's happening, uh, I'm going to now uh, just cover that up just in case um, the bees may come while we're working the hive next door. I'm gonna use a, a wax wrap. So this is a cloth impregnated with uh, wax called a honey bee or honeybee wrap. Great thing to use, saves kitchen cling wrap, uh, adding more plastic to our world. Fantastic, okay, so over to this hive over here and get our smoker going, make sure we're protected. Okay, I gave them a little smoke ready so it won't need too much and I'm going to leave the smoker right at the entrance just so they continue to get a whiff of the smoke as they come home. That'll keep them nice and calm. Don't forget to protect yourself if you need a beekeeping, wear your gloves as well. You want to minimise those stings. Okay, roof off. Actually we might just take the whole box off in one hit and that way we can uh, basically um, just get straight in to the brood nest where we're going to collect some honeycomb. So to do that, I'm going to take that off and that gives us a nice handle. There's not much honey in this box so it's nice and light but it is heavy. Make sure you get some help. Okay, I'm going to have to loosen it up just by putting the, the key in under here and giving it a good lever. So the the tools, this is your your hive tool. The chisel end goes in to loosen things up and then it can come off. When you put it down, put it down in such a way you don't squash bees underneath just by leaning it up on an edge. Okay. Now we've got our excluder that's going to come off nice and gently. Pry it off with the tool again. If you're just tuning in, what we're doing today is showing you how to harvest some honeycomb from your flow hive. Lots of different ways to do it. You could put a whole nother box on to collect honeycomb, or you could simply take some from the side of the brood nest. Quick check, make sure the queen's not on the underside of the excluder. And leave that at the entrance so she can crawl in if she needs to. Okay. You can see a lot of a lot of bees here. We've got a bit of burr comb connecting frames together. 
So I'm looking for a comb that might be easy to, to get out if there's, um, which sometimes isn't the one on the edge. So I'm gonna go for this one here and often the ones on the edge, the ones that have, have uh, honey, because the brood nest tends to be more in the middle. Not always, but uh, usually. So what we're going to do, because we don't want to break the surface of our honeycomb, is just cut away this burr comb. So I'll do that now. I'm not going to use too much smoke because I don't want to flavor the honeycomb with smoke. Okay, so I'm just scraping down like this, loosening up the frame so it's easier to pull out. I'm going to leave her crossways a little bit using the chisel end of the tool. Don't forget to put your questions in the comments below. Today we're harvesting some honeycomb, hopefully. We'll see what's in this box here. This is a swarm we caught recently, so it should be nice, fresh looking honeycomb. Right. So lifting that up nice and slow because it's the first one. And there's a lot of bees, we haven't used much smoke to smoke them out of the way. We're going to go nice and slow because we don't want to roll the bees between the comb surfaces. Or they might get damaged. So I'm just gently coming up. Once you've got the first frame out, the others are much easier. Look at that, we have got honey on the edge here. It's a beautiful full frame of honey. So there you go harvesting honeycomb from the hive. Now I'm going to just rest this on the side while we have a look at the next comb because what I want to do is show you the difference between brood and also the uh, honey. You don't want to harvest honeycomb from a frame that's got brood. Just experiencing some sound issues. Is the sounding any better? Okay, let me know if you can hear me okay. Apparently we've got sound issues today, that's unfortunate. We've got a bit of a windy day here, it's a bit of a grey day. Not the kind of day you would normally open up a hive. I'll try and uh, speak up a little bit. And have we got a, a uh, no we haven't got our mic, so just pull that and we'll go direct in. Keep it nice and close and you should be able to hear me. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear okay. All right, so next we're going to pull out a frame right next to it to see what it's like when it's got brood on it. Just so you can tell the difference between brood and honeycomb, which is an important thing as a new beekeeper to learn how to do. So here we have a comb with brood and honey, and you can see this is honey up the top here, this nice light capping that's slightly translucent. But this is also honey here, but you can still see those translucent markings between the, the capping um, of each individual cell. But over here, it's quite opaque, and that is the brood. So it could be darker than that, or it could be lighter than that. You can have dark honeycomb, you can have light, but you'll soon get your eye in, and that is the, the bees going through their metamorphosis in their little cocoons in each cell. So important not to cut that up when you're harvesting honeycomb from your brood box. Beautiful, okay. So we know which um, comb we want now. What we might do is just show you how to to cut some comb out in a way that's really quick. Because we're using foundation wax or wire holding this uh, honeycomb in, and we also don't have any plastic foundation. It's a nice, well built out comb, so you can shake that. You wanna shake all the bees off with a short, sharp shake. There we go. And the remaining ones you can brush off with a bee brush or some foliage if you don't carry a bee brush with you. So, the remaining bees, making sure the queen's not on there. And 
think we've got some open honeycomb cells which do look quite nice when you're plating up as well because you get to see that beautiful structure that the bees make. So we're just gently brushing the last remaining bees off and then you can take that away for cutting some honeycomb out. Now you could take the whole lot if you want to or you could just cut some out and put the frame back in and that's exactly what I'm going to show you today because it's one advantage that you can do with foundationless frames. Now let's just have a look and see what's going on here. Our jar is now half full of honey and it's a beautiful black floral honey which is fantastic. Same time we'll get ourselves ready for cutting up that honeycomb and Put it, the frame straight back in the hive and you can go again. Okay. So a couple of people just saying, you know, when you eat the honeycomb, do you just spit out the wax or is it okay to just swallow the wax? Well, generally you'd spit it out and save that for candle making. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can, can swallow it, it'll, it'll just pass through, I believe, but I generally chew it up and spit that out. So, what we're going to do is harvest some honeycomb right onto this plate. You could just take this inside, but in, today we're just going to cut a bit out and give the rest back to the bees. And it's easy to do with a knife if you're using a foundationless frame like this one. So cut around. And you can experiment if, you, if you're taking some comb to a wedding you're going to want a nice, beautiful shape like this. And look at that. Oh, Peter. <laughs> what you've got is some beautiful Perfect. honeycomb on a plate. And what's really interesting is when you put this back in the hive, the bees will fill that in with a different kind of honey. So, uh, of course, you might like to add some cheese or some blueberries or something to your plate like this and that you'll be very popular at the next gathering you go to if you if you add a little little uh, bling to your plate of honeycomb and um, it's a it's a beautiful thing and it just creates such interesting stories around the table and people will ask questions about bees all night long it's a wonderful thing and of course bees and flowers go together so pick some from the garden, whack them on there, and what you've got is something that is uh, going to make you very popular at the next gathering. <laughs> Should we be allowed to gather again one yes. of these days soon? Seat of the Master Chef, that is so awesome. I can see a lot of Christmas tables having that this year. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that just a beautiful artwork by the bees? And it's so nice to see that cross section. There's no foundation in here, it's just amazing cross-section of their honeycomb. So the bees have created all of this, and it's a real treat. Beautiful. So what we're going to do is put that frame back into the hive, and then we'll come back to this hive in a moment and see how our honey is going. Remember, we've still got the hive open. It is a greyish, rainy day when you shouldn't really be opening hives. Mid morning to mid afternoon on a nice sunny day is what you want to be doing. Okay, so all you need to do now is just slide that back in from where it came, and the bees will do their amazing work and fill that in again. Another trick you can do is cut out some, some beautiful shapes and then give them back to the bees to naturalize again. And you can take comb to a wedding as if the bees have made it in love hearts. I've done that once before for my uh, stepsister's wedding. It's great, made it onto the top of the wedding cake and everything. All right, there we go. So that's back in and um, the bees are fine with that. They'll just fill that in really quickly and I'll be surprised if that's not filled in by tomorrow. Because there's a flow on, the bees will just get right in there, repair that area and fill 
the comb in ready to go again. If you've got wax and wire in the frame, that's okay too, but you'll be cutting smaller shapes or cutting along those wire lines and cutting out rectangles of honeycomb. As said, if you've got plastic foundation, you won't be able to do that, but you can mix it up in the box and you can, if you've got plastic foundation, don't worry, you can put some, some uh, foundationless frames on the edge. The bees won't mind mixing it up a bit. Just do what works for you. I might just add a little bit of smoke because I can notice the bees are just getting a little bit grumpy about being open this long on such a grey old day. Okay, any questions? Yeah, there's quite a lot coming in the seat on You'll have to step yeah, up here. Yeah, I might just try plug this back oh, in. Okay. Can well, you let me know? It won't work. You... Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, so, so we've got audio difficulties today, so please tell me to speak up if we need to speak up. <laughs> okay. We're gonna, people are saying it's okay, so hopefully they can hear me as well. Peter. Um, fantastic. Pe so many people commenting on the bees seed on how calm they are, and people saying that their own bees would be going completely nuts. What's, what's your secret to having calm bees? Is it the type, or is it just your cool, natural vibe? Uh, no, it's mainly genetics actually. There is about being calm with bees and that does help a bit, but it's mostly genetics. So if you've got grumpy bees and you'd like calm ones, you need to get in there, change the queen to one with some friendly genetics. And any bee breeder will be breeding bees for those calm genetics. You can put them into the hive. A month later, you'll have a, a docile colony. They even get more docile than this one. This one was starting to, to show signs of wanting to sting my hands but uh, a really friendly colony that you've uh, that you can get off a, a queen breeder is a, a real pleasure to work with so a nice thing to do if you really want to get in there with your gloves off and things like that right see so when you're smoking it um, a couple of people have mentioned that they've done it and then when they've gone to eat the honeycomb it tastes quite smoky yes that's right i did mention uh don't do too much smoke because especially if you've got open honeycomb cells that aren't capped yet, a lot of flavor will get in there on the honey. And while smoky honey's kind of a delicacy, it might not be the flavor you're after. Or it could enhance the <laughs> smoky flavor. <laughs> um, we've got a few locals calling in from Ocean Shores and we've got Ro Ritchie coming in from Mullumbimby. Um, she's asking, how do you know um, the, her bees have been bearding on the outside of her hive is it just that they're, it's too hot or is it, do you think it's time to provide them with some shade? It, it's definitely the heat right in our area. It's, we're getting some really hot days now. So you'll be getting bees bearding on the front of the hive and in some cases covering the whole front of the hive. Now that's okay when it's hot, that's what they'll do. That's their sensible way of air conditioning. They need to provide more air spaces in the hive to get some airflow. So a whole bunch of them will vacate the, the space as they fan and do their incredible work. Now, if you find that they're getting um, really crowded, in fact, this hive is getting a bit crowded. Let's have a look in the side window. So. If you've got a whole lot of bees covering the front and you look in the window and you can hardly see the comb because there's so many bees, then you better give them a, another box or take a split. I tend to take a split and keep my hives smaller, but lots of people tend to add another super or another brood box just to give the bees some more room. So keep an eye on it. The windows are great for that. The windows really help you to see when they're getting crowded. This one's just boomed in population recently, so we better give them some more space or take a split. Great. Melissa's asking any tricks for bee robbing. Um, sadly, they lost a lot of bees this winter by some very aggressive foragers. Oh, okay. So the main thing bee robbing is, is um, don't leave honey around like this. I'm keeping a careful eye here really important don't leave honey around or that will create robber bees they'll get a taste for honey instead of flowers and then they'll they'll go and rob hives that don't have many bees in them because they're easy hives for them to get into so while i'm putting this on top of here for this show and tell don't leave honeycomb outside and don't leave your jars uncovered for very long if you see bees coming for the honey make sure you cover up your honey take it away it's, it's actually illegal in many states to leave honey open 
out for that reason because you could be sharing pathogens around. Now, having said that, you might just have the one hive and there's bees robbing for some other reason. Maybe there's not much of a flow on and your colony is really weak and those bees are just opportunistic and hungry. So if you see that, you're gonna, going to need to manage that process. And the, the best way to do that, like we showed you a couple of weeks ago, is to block the entrance of the hive with some grass or anything at all actually. If you've got nothing else, you can just use some mulch and poke it in the front and just leave just enough room for a bee to go in and out. And that gives the colony uh, a reduced entrance size to defend. So that'll give your colony the best chance. If the bees are still robbing and trying to get in every crack in the hive and, and barging the entrance and there's still tussles going on at the front, then you might need to close it all together for, for a day till that settles down. But if you are closing it all together, make sure there's enough ventilation in the hive. Bees can suffocate, they don't have enough ventilation. So that's really important. Why don't I show you just how to do that now at the front of one of these hives. So let's, um, let's uh, wonder which hive we can, we can use. Let's go right up to this little one up here. It um, looks a bit, bit low in numbers and could do with entrance resistance. So this is just a, a, a um, quick trick. Oh, this, this next one's probably a little more accessible. So if you come around to the front of the hive, you're going to probably want to uh, give them a little bit of smoke in order to, to get the bees out of the way. But um, the idea is you can just push some mulch into the front and you keep going along. And what will happen is the bees will naturally pull that out over a week or so. And that gives you a, an entrance reducer that you don't have to come back and think about. The bees will remove it as they need to. So you can keep going and just leave a small gap on one edge. And that's a really important to do, thing to do if you notice robbing bees. Robbing behavior is quite easy to spot because they're kind of erratic and they're trying to get in every crack. And um, you might even see some, some fighting happening, uh, some tussles on the landing board. Great questions. Yeah, good questions, Cedar. And um, uh, Jimmy's just asking, and they probably don't realise how close these hives are actually to our headquarters here, because just wondering how much space you do need um, to keep the beehive. Keep, keep, they've just got a little small garden space and would that be all right? So people keep bees in all sorts of wonderful places, on balconies, in the city, on rooftops, in urban backyards and on farms. And, and the wonderful thing is they take up a very small footprint, so you don't need a lot of area. Your bees are then spreading out over over three kilometre radius, which is a huge amount of area, and bring that nectar back into your hive. So in a way, you, you're doing agriculture over a large area, but you only need this amount of space to put your hive. Having said that, you do need to consider the flight path and you don't want to go bothering your neighbours. So, so if you had neighbours really close on the other side of the fence, perhaps choose a spot where the, the bees aren't, going, aren't likely to fly right over their washing line or right where they're going to, to walk and things like that. And I've got videos showing you um, more about that in situating your hive. If you go to thebeekeeper.org, there's a great in-depth course we've put together with experts from all around the world. All around the world. You can also look on our YouTube channel and Facebook page for more training in beekeeping. Right here, we are quite close to the house. If you swing the, the camera around this way, you can see, but um, we're very comfortable with bees here where we are. So we don't mind having lots of hives close by the house. Another thing you might consider when you're situating your hive is the veranda light or porch light um, might attract a few bees in the night time. So if you can situate it so the bees from their entrance can't see that light, then that'll be better. You don't want a whole lot of bees buzzing around the light at night time. Great, um, Chuck Rouse just joined us. He's one of our ambassadors. He's suggesting maybe Cupid was a beekeeper after your heart-shaped honeycomb. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, just um, a couple of people have just tuned in a little bit later. Just wondering where you got that honeycomb frame from. Was it the super or the brood box? Okay, we got that right out of the brood box. Typically, in the brood box, you've got honey on the edges and brood in the middle. 
not always sometimes they'll take the brood right out to the edge so if you don't know the difference between brood and honey it's it's a wonderful thing to learn and we've got some great videos and training material at thebeekeeper.org to help you understand and learn from square one to a deep scientific knowledge of beekeeping um, but yeah you can cut some honeycomb right out of the brood nest the bees will replace that very quickly it's a wonderful thing to take to a uh, to a party you'll be very popular if you turn up with a plate of honeycomb like this <laughs> <laughs> Especially once we can all go to party. <laughs> um, so the, Nico's asking from Sydney, how long does a nectar flow usually ask for? Sorry, can't hear me. Nectar flow usually lasts, uh, well it really depends actually. It depends on the species. Some species will flower for a long time and sometimes you'll get a whole forest of species that, are, that one tree will go, then another tree will go a bit later and it can sp span over many months. And that's happening right now in this area with the ironbark. You'll also get times where it might even be as short as a day. So the, the Melaleuca, which they call the rain tree by the, um, but by the local indigenous people here. And that's because when it rains, it flowers. And that could happen anywhere from autumn right through to spring. And that flowering can be quite short and you'll smell the smell of the Melaleuca. It's like this sickly, sweet, almost burnt toffee smell and it might just go on. So it really depends, like many things in beekeeping, on um, what's going on in the environment. Great, Roxanne's tuned in from New York and just wondering if you keep adding brood boxes, will the, col will the colony keep growing? And what is the biggest a colony, a colony you can grow in terms of numbers? So conventional beekeepers, the mentality is more so store the honey on the hive and then harvest it all at once because while you're going through that long labor intensive hot heavy work you may as well keep going and harvest all your honey at once now the flow hive beekeeping is a bit different you can just harvest a jar of honey and this is plenty enough to to keep you going for for um, even weeks a jar of honey like this so you might just tap off a little bit as you go and that way you're storing honey in jars on this on the shelf instead of in many stacked boxes having said that there's the colony size comes into effect. So if you have more boxes and you have a virile queen that's laying lots of eggs, you can sustain a population with many boxes and you can get a bigger hive that could collect more honey. So there's a bit of management there and a bit of decisions to make. In the end, if you keep your hive small like this, they will build up and you should take splits more often and that way you're getting multiple hives. If you want to run, uh, if you want to do less splits, you might decide just to stack more boxes onto your hive and run your colonies bigger. So, up to you. There's no right or wrong, really. And do you find beekeepers in the same area that will swear one way or the other? So, um, it's more about uh, how you manage and look after your bees. You could, of course, add more boxes to this hive by uh, adding another super or another brood box. Some people will add boxes till there's stacked five, six, seven boxes high. So that means to harvest honey in the conventional way, you're climbing up a step ladder, taking boxes of honey off. There's honey dripping on your head. You're climbing down the ladder and that is hard work. So I like to do it this way. It's nice and simple and it's a beautiful way to harvest honey. Great, so actually that brings us to a question that came in earlier about somebody trying to move their hives and just wondering what do you do to sort of hold it all together when you're moving a hive, you know, quite a distance? Okay, great question. So we have got videos on how to move your hive both on our YouTube channel and in thebeekeeper.org and the basics of it is well, there's quite a lot to it actually, but in terms of the holding it all together, you simply use some good straps. The type of ratchet straps that click click as you close them, you don't want to use the toggle cam ones because they just don't grip uh, well enough. There is an Australian invention called an M-lock specific to beekeeping. If you don't have M-locks, then you can just use the ratchet straps you can get down at the hardware store. And put two around your hive, you take the, the roof off, just leave your inner cover in place, put two good straps around, crank them down, and make sure your hive is well held together. Now, 
Commercial beekeepers will move the hive's open entrance, but I would suggest that you don't. If you're going to move your hive, then do it in, in the um, evening or early morning. Close the bees up in the night time by, uh, you can use some steel wool or, or some kind of blocker to block the entrance. Make sure they've got ventilation um, down the bottom of that hive. And that was a, a good bit to add to the question earlier about the hive getting hot. You've got good ventilation control down under here. Vents up is a lot of air passing through those vents. Vents down actually blocks the ventilation. So make sure you're getting good ventilation. You could even take the, the uh, tray out altogether when you're moving your hive just to make sure they get enough oxygen in transport and don't let them get hot if they're traveling a, uh, a long way. So a few things in there, but there's, there's more to the story I'll just go over quickly. And that's bees geolocate to a spot. So if you just move this across the yard to the other side, all the foraging bees will come back to this point here and you lose a whole lot of bees from that hive. They might even ball up on a branch here going, where's my hive, where's my hive? So if you're going to move them a short distance, just move them a meter or two at a time and slowly get them used to that new position. If you're gonna move them a long way, then um, you can just move them more than say um, six kilometers or four miles and they won't remember the, the surrounding area and they can geolocate to that new spot. However, if you're moving them just uh, say a, a mile or a kilometer down the road, they will remember the new spot and they'll come right back to here. They remember the old spot, sorry. So that means you can either go more than four miles or six kilometers, leave them there for a month and then bring them back to the new location. Or you could use some distraction techniques to try and get them to reorientate. And the way you do that is you just move the hive to the new location and then you, you uh, tape a rag over the entrance or a whole lot of foliage. So when the bees come racing out, they run into that obstacle and go, hang on, something's different. Then they go through their orientation flight and relocate to that new uh, location. And that works for the most part. You still get some returning, but you get a whole lot less returning to the old spot. So a few tips and tricks there. Again, there's a lot to it. So if you want more advice, go and have a look at the beekeeper.org. Right, so um, Joan always called him from tropical island of Jamaica. Wow. Just wondering, um, obviously it's a very hot climate, maybe similar to ours. What sort of paint and oil you've used on this hive? Okay, if you want to keep a hive looking good, you will have to oil it, give it a bit of a rub back every now and then, and, and re-oil it. This is a linseed oil that we've gotten from the local hardware store. And as you can see, it needs another coat. It was coated some time ago. So every six months or so, you want to add another coat. After all, you are going against what nature wants to do, which is turn it back into the earth. So if you want to keep wood looking like that natural wood color, which is beautiful, you'll have to put some TLC into it. Otherwise you can paint it with a good hard wearing house paint and that will also uh, keep it looking good for a long time. So a few options there. Decking products seem to last the longest, but they often have a tint to them. So it depends whether you want the perfectly natural wood look or whether you're happy to have it a little tinted. So some decisions for you to think about as you go down to your local hardware store. Great, right, Cedar, I'm Nairies from New South Wales, and we're um, living in really strong winds. And if fence in front of our hive, just wondering what's that distance between that two fence and our hive? So this isn't ideal. You've got 1.5 meters from the hive entrance to the fence. And what happens, especially with this foliage here, is the bees can't set up their normal flight path of straight out the front and away, and they're actually doubling back. So that's why you see a whole lot of bees flying past me here, which makes it just uh, not as easy to have a sunny right behind the hive. You might get bees stuck in your hair, more likely to get a sting. So better if you can, give them a nice straight flight path out the front, but it's not always the case. In this case, we've got a fence there and it doesn't matter too much, but it's just one more consideration. So I just saw a cheeky bee coming to look at this honey. We might have to move this away 
You don't want robber bees coming and getting pathogens from one hive and sharing them to the next. So we'll um, take that away. Thank you very much. It's a, a beautiful thing. Okay, thank you for asking all your great questions. If you've got more, put them in the comments below and we'll keep asking them. We've uh, got time, we'll keep answering them. We've got time for, for a few more questions. The idea is we help you get started in beekeeping, so don't be shy, put your questions in the comments. Cedar, um, Joshua was asking, I'm um, living in Sydney, just got a five frame ute to fill the brood box. How long do you reckon it'll take to fill completely like the eight frames? Okay, like many things in beekeeping, the answer is it depends. And while one hive could fill all of that in a day if the colony was big and it was a busy flow, it's more likely to take months. And, and sometimes, yeah, probably the average would be um, three, four weeks, they would fill out all of those frames and be getting ready for a super. And that's in a time when there's flowers, so in the spring time here in Australia. If you're at another time of year or for whatever reason, perhaps there's been a drought and there's, there's not many flowers around with their nectar, you might find it takes a whole lot longer and you might not even get honey that season. And that's farming, that's agriculture. Any type of agriculture depends on the weather. So, so you'll have to take that into account. When you have a strong colony and that coincides with a big nectar flow, things happen very quickly and it's very exciting. It's always a good idea to have more than one hive because sometimes one hive will be weak and slow and another hive will be really strong and going and getting that nectar and producing a lot of honey. See, the Robert's asking, when's a good time in the year, during the year to split a hive? So splitting hives is best when the bees are really building up. So here we have bees really building up. If we have a look in this side window, there's a lot of bees a good time to split. In fact, if we don't, we risk that the hive might swarm. Now we're past that first month of spring where the hives are more likely to swarm, so, so they, they, they may not, but just to be on the safe side, we get in there and take a split. And it's also a good idea to take splits because it, you get to then share that colony with somebody else who's really wanting bees. And there seems to always be a shortage of bees in our world. Henry. Cedar Henry um, calling in from Los Angeles have, has a new uke, nuke, has had it for three weeks. If, if they do a top feeder, is it a problem to use the empty honey super for shim until I need to use it? I guess you all know what shim means. Is that no, like that's, that's a good idea. So if you've got a feeder that's too big to fit under the roof of your flow hive, then using another box is a great idea that'll house your feeder and you can put a, a tall jar in there. I did uh, make a, a, a video on Facebook Live, it's probably on our YouTube channel as well, of how to make, I think we called it the quick and dirty feeder. And there's a lot of different styles you can make under the roof of your hive to feed them if you need to. You can also get a round top feeder, which just about fits nicely under the flow hive roof. And it fits through the hole in the inner cover and you can use the roof as a cover. But as said, you can always put another brood box over the top of that to give it plenty of space and then your roof on top of that. It's a good idea. Great idea. Um, we've got Mario, a fellow Aussie, not sure where Mario's tuning in from. Just wondering, um, he's about to get the brood box. Should he just set it up with the brood box and the roof and then wait before he puts the super on? And how long would you generally wait for that? Absolutely. So make sure your brood box is bustling with bees and they're finished drawing all of the combs. So they're, they're using all of the combs in the hive. So the, the frames they're called, they've drawn their comb down, lots of bees before you then put on your super. That way you're not giving a very small colony and a huge amount of space that they can't keep warm. So the risk there is you give them too much space, a tiny colony just finds it a bit harder especially if you've got cold nights. Here in the, the warm um, subtropics, you can get away with adding the super a lot earlier, um, but generally you wait till the, the brood box is nice and full before adding any honey supers on top. 
Oh, great. Oh, this is a good one um, from the Adelaide Powder Coating Company. Um, as an alternative method of harvesting honeycomb, is it possible to place a glass bowl upside down over the inner cover in the hole and let the bees build their comb in there? Absolutely. Great idea. So what they're talking about there is getting in under this roof. I'll take away these beautiful little jars of honey that we harvested last week. They're uh, such a, a joy to have all of these different colours and flavours. Look at the stack difference between those two. It's just incredible. You've got those light flow bursts and the deep multi-tones that come in over winter. And it's such a joy to isolate those flavours frame by frame. And then you get to share them and the story that comes with it. Okay, so we're looking under our flow hive roof and here is a plug you can pull out now if you give that a gentle twist and then bring it up you find that there's bees right under there and what you can do is put a container over here which then limits the bees instead of building honeycomb all in the roof cavity like they will if you pull that out they'll build it inside the container. Quite a good way to go. You can use one of those glass uh, baking dishes and that way you can watch the process happen, which is a wonderful thing to do. I love that idea. So you know, Melissa's asking now that you've shown all those beautiful coloured honeys, what gives the honey the different colours? So what gives it the colour is the nectar in the beginning. So be it faint, the nectar has a colour itself and when they concentrate it, that colour gets concentrated. So what you're seeing here is a nectar that is so light when they collect it that it almost has no colour at all. But when they, they reduce it and reduce it and reduce it down to become this nice thick honey, then it's, it's gaining a, a, a light yellow. Whereas this one here is almost black. So that, that nectar had enough tint to, to colour that into, you can hardly even see through it, it's incredible very dark red. So dark, it's beautiful. Um, Melissa's asking, Cedar, wondering how do you tell the difference between a queen cell that is waiting for an egg to be laid in and a queen cell that has hatched? Okay, so you'll need sharp eyes for that and it'll take a bit of getting used to. But if you look down the queen cell, you'll, um, um, I, I see your question. <laughs> The, the way you tell it, it is if the queen's already emerged, it'll have a raggy edge around it. So if the queen cell's like this, and it's got a nice neat edge, then it might be waiting for an egg, or it could have a young larvae in there that's being fed. But if it's torn, that means that queen has actually chewed her way out. So just focus in on the edge of the queen cell, and you'll be able to tell. Great, Cedar. Um, got someone in a very cold climate, Art, in Northern Ohio. Just wondering, will this system work in really cold climates? That's a question we often get, and the answer is yes. We have beekeepers in cold climates, even as far as Norway. We have a lot in Canada. We have a lot in Europe, and they're all very cold places. So, so um, there is no issue with it working. Generally, you're harvesting honey in the warm time of year, so your honey will still flow out fine. But even if it is cold when you get to harvesting your honey, it just might take longer. I've done some experiments in the early days because it was a question we did one of. We got our coldest time of year when there's frost on the ground and we harvested the edge frames that were quite, um, quite cool. And it just means it takes a lot longer for your honey to flow out and into your jar. So, so uh, it definitely does work in cold climates, despite the myth that's been circulating. <laughs> um, Cedar, this is a question that I think your family doesn't have. Just wondering approximately how long you think honey lasts once you've harvested it in your pantry? <laughs> well, in my, pantry, in, in my pantry, it doesn't last very long yes. at all. <laughs> um, but for the questions, how long does it last on the shelf? Now that's a different question. It will last a long time on the shelf provided the moisture content is below that 20% range. If it's higher, 
than 20%, it will start to ferment and turn into honey mead. So if you notice that your honey is particularly runny in the jar, typically it comes out a bit warm. So let it cool down and just check that it looks like honey and it's nice and thick. If it's still quite liquid, you might have harvested it a bit early. Perhaps there was a whole section of the frame that wasn't capped and the moisture content might be high and that honey could ferment. So you need to consume that to make sure it doesn't go off. Or you can keep it in the fridge for longer. Now, if the honey is ready, it'll last for a very long time. In fact, it's been found 3,000 years old in the uh, tombs in, the, in Egypt, in the pyramids. So, so it will last a very long time if that moisture content doesn't get too high. It's full of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, medicinal properties, and, and um, natural um, peroxides, and also um, uh, the, the sugars themselves. As long as the water content's low, it will keep. We'll typically go candied, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that it's changed into a crystalline form. And my kids love the crispy honey, they call it. <laughs> nice, the crispy honey. Like the idea of that 3,000 year old jar of honey. Yeah, I'd like to taste some of that. It's <laughs> no. Probably off limits. Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> Deb's asking, could you have two flow supers on one brood box? Certainly, you certainly can. And well, we don't have any right at the moment, but how about on this hive here, instead of taking a split like I was talking about earlier, next week we'll put a super on top, give them some more room, and we'll have a double super flow hive. I have done that a lot in the past and people do do that. So by all means, go in there, put another flow super on, put another regular super on, or put another brood box on, whatever you want to do. Mix it up, see what works for you. Right, Jane, um, a beekeeper, and she had a beekeeper come over and noticed that we hadn't didn't use wax sheets in our brood mm, frames. Yes. And now, of course, she's seen you cut out that beautiful heart shape and just wondering, oh, should she have not have used the wax sheets? It doesn't matter. For most of my beekeeping life, I've used the wax sheets, as you say, the sort of wax foundation and wires. And you go through that process of, of connecting them to a car battery, heating up the wires and melting those sheets in. And that way it keeps the bees nice and straight in the brood box. Now, a lot of beekeepers prefer that. It means you can put those foundation sheets in and you'll know the bees will build straight. Well, actually, they'll still build bent sometime, especially if the wax sheet uh, falls off those wires, which you learn not to do pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't matter at all. You can still cut honeycomb between the wires and it's a wonderful way to go with foundation sheets as well. I um, prefer not to. I just let the bees do it themselves and it saves me a whole lot of time waxing and wiring. However, on the flip side, there's a bit more time making sure the bees are building nice and straight in the beginning. But I find that a wonderful thing, getting in there, watching the bees build the comb for the first time. Great. James is asking, do bees naturally collect different types of nectar in separate frames or do they mix nectar from all different sources? Basically what happens is bees start filling from generally the centre of the hive out towards the extremities. But what happens is one nectar flow will finish and another one will start. So then you get a bit of a variety across your frames. So you might get some, some dark honeys coming in in the winter time around here. And then as spring comes some light honey. So you might end up with that dark honey in the center and some light honey on the edges. Then what happens is you go and harvest a frame like this and they'll fill it up with whatever's flowering at the moment. And then you've got an entirely new flavor again. So you end up with all of these different, different honey flavors and I would really recommend that you separate them by harvesting a single frame um, to jars rather than putting all the frames into a, a bucket and mixing all of those beautiful flavors together. That's nice as well, but I find it's nicer to separate the dark from light and really enjoy the, the deep multi flavors and the, the floral uh, light ones and the, the in-between butterscotches that you get in your hive. Oh, Thank yeah. you very much for all your questions. We've got time for a couple more and then we'll wrap it up. Okie doke. Uh, Troy's um, tuning in, wants to collect honey, but just wondering should he not collect honey during the winter time? Um, he's a vegan and wants to make sure that it's completely harmless to the bees and that they have enough food. So 
So that depends whereabouts in the world you are. Let us know where you are. But basically, you want to make sure the bees have enough food for themselves to last a, a time when there's not many flowers. For, for most people, that's their winter. If you get a long, cold winter, you might need to leave them a whole box of honey to survive the winter. Or in extreme cases, two boxes of honey. And that'll depend a bit on your management practices with your, with your bees. But basically, if you're concerned, what the flow hive allows you to do is just harvest a little bit here We've taken one frame and we've got this beautiful big jar of honey and we'll leave the rest for the bees and let them continue filling up this hive. As you can see, some of these frames are getting full while some aren't full yet. So we'll let those bees continue filling this before we harvest any more. With the flow hive, you can also just take part of a frame. If you're really unsure, but you still wanna taste the honey, just insert the key a little way like that and turn it. And that will just be a portion of one frame and it will still fill up a, a good sized jar of honey, but um, it, you'll leave, be leaving the rest for the bees. What I'm gonna show you now is just resetting the frame back. We're going to turn it off. The honey flow has slowed down to a trickle. So we're going to turn it off now and let the bees go about their work, re-waxing and rebuilding the cells. So you'll notice two slots at the top here. What I'm gonna do is just insert the key into the top slot and push that all the way back till you hear a knock at the back. That's it. It's important to push it all the way because you wanna make sure all those cells are returned to the cell formed position. So all you have to do is then move that down. It's not very hard to turn back and the bees will now get right in there. In fact, if you watch here, you can see them poking their heads down the cells already, already starting to work those cells and and repair them and the whole process will start again oh and fantastic um so to just any tips and tricks how long once you've put your super on and your brood box is completely full and maybe a week or two week goes by how long should the bees take before they start putting start putting their honey into the flow frames or are there tips and tricks to encourage them okay great that's a common question and the answer is it can take a long time depending on the nectar flow and how strong your colony is. If you're getting impatient and, and you really wanna see some activity up there on the flow frames, I generally don't do anything. I leave them as they are, as they arrive in the box. But if you want to speed up the process, if it's time to put the super on, the bees would have started to build some burr comb on top of the frames in your brood box most likely and you can scrape that off. You get a bit of honey and wax on here and just put that into the side of your flow frame. Don't be afraid, you won't wreck it. Just push that honeycomb in and do it in the side window and you can enjoy watching the bees recycle that wax and start their process of waxing up the cells, depositing the nectar and the whole process will start from there. But uh, if you don't get a nectar flow, it still will be a long time before they will fill the cells. In some cases, you might not get any in the whole season, simply because there's not enough flowers around. In other cases, it might be an issue with the bees where there's not enough bees in the hive. You wanna see lots of bees when you open the windows and a good nectar flow, and that's when they'll really start filling the frames. It gets really exciting when they're doing it. Uh, sometimes, you can see them actually fill all the frames in a couple of weeks, but that's an extreme scenario. It usually will take weeks and months to fill the frames. And then eventually you'll start to see it appear in these end frame like this, and you'll see the beautiful work of the bees, and you can even watch them depositing nectar with their tongues. Oh look, there's one bee sleeping there. Bees shift work, so, so they'll find an empty cell just to sleep in, while they uh, catch up on, on a bit of rest and then they'll go about their business again. If you tap that, it'll actually wake up. Let's see, <laughs> just tapping that hive. That's a bit mean, isn't it, I suppose? But um, there we up, go, me. it's waking up, wake up. And um, you can actually watch the bee wake up and reverse out of that cell. Looks like it's having a good nap there. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But, uh, probably wake up soon. Thank you so much for all your questions. If you've got more questions, put them in the comments below. We'll keep answering them. 
let us know what you'd like us to see. Tune in again next week and don't forget to check out beekeeper.org if you want to really immerse yourself in some high quality content from experts around the world. It's free to try and the idea is it takes you from ground one to a deep scientific knowledge of beekeeping. Because so after all, it's only when you look after the bees that you get this amazing reward of the beautiful honey and 